Uh, my name is Sarah Pasty, and I'm the director of the Samuel Dorsky Museum, and very pleased to welcome you and all of you to the museum today so that we can have a discussion about Rudy Burkhardt and holography. Anyway, I should well, thank you. you. So anyway, my, my, job is, my job is actually oh, to turn... <laughs> Is, is to turn the mic over to uh, the museum's curator of exhibitions and programs, Daniel Belasco, who is going to serve as the moderator for the panel, and he will introduce you to everyone who's sitting here. Thank you. Great. Yes, welcome, everyone. Uh, normally, um, at the Dorsky Museum, uh, we'd love to bring artists in to talk about their work. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, Rudy Burkhout passed away in 2008. Um, we're unable to do that, but instead, uh, fortunately, so many of the people who he uh, collaborated with uh, in many different ways are in the area and able to share memories, experiences, insights into his working process. Uh, even the installation of the exhibition, in many ways, has been a, sort of a group effort um, with Michael and Hudson uh, coming in and showing myself and uh, uh, the preparator, Bob Wagner, and our installer, Mike Prudhomme, how to hang the holograms, how to tune them. Uh, they're very precise, and we really relied uh, very much on their expertise for the installation. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Professor Catherine Hearn, Professor of Physics here, who's also been a great collaborator. This is actually the second of three programs that the museum has been doing uh, about holography, um, just because we're excited to share this um, medium with people on campus who might not have had any experience with it before. Um, so Hart Perry gave a very well-received lecture uh, a few months ago, and on June 4th, we have a, a holography workshop. So Saturday, June 4th, please, uh, please come back for that. So this is a very, going to be a very informal panel, and uh, we have four people, and I will introduce each briefly, and I, they will share, uh, share some insights, memories, and comments about Rudy, and then we'll have a larger conversation. So uh, on my left, uh, Hudson Talbot was Rudy Burkhout's life partner and is manager with Fred Burkhout of the Rudy Burkhout Collection. He's also a well-known uh, children's book illustrator and author. I'm giving you the brief biographies, the full ones are in the program. Uh, Jason Sapin, his career in holography began in 1968 working for Time, introducing holography to the first public exhibition of holography and laser technology uh, with Bell Labs. Uh, and since then he's done an uh, extraordinary range of uh, portraiture in, in holography. Sam, Mar uh, sorry, um, Michael Gabor is next. Uh, he was a docent at the Museum of Holography on Mercer Street. He was also Rudy Burkhout's assistant um, from 1981, or 82 to 1989. And uh, also took a lot of beautiful photos of the holograms, many of which are in the catalog. So if you haven't seen the catalog or had a chance to pick it up, uh, it's on the front desk. So, um, so thanks for your great photography as well as your assistance with, um, with Rudy. And um, also, the, the far left, Sam Murray, is uh, one of the pioneering holographic artists who uses sculptural elements to interact with his holograms, such as metal, wood, and neon. Fortunately, holography is a living uh, art form. He teaches a class on holography at SVA. He was just at Ohio State teaching a workshop in holography, and his works will be on view at the Hol Hollow Center on Governor's Island this summer. So uh, please take a trip out to Governor's Island to, to see it. So I'll pass the mic over to Hudson, and everyone will have a chance to make some comments, and then we'll uh, open it up to a larger conversation. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so yes, again, my name's Hudson Talbot. Uh, live here in the Hudson Valley, uh, and uh, lived here with Rudy. We were partners for 37 years, life partners. Um, and so I am not the guy to ask about how a hologram is made. The, the, these gentlemen here will tell you all about that, so save all those good questions for them. Um, what I can and would happily share some light on is Rudy as a person and his point of view as an artist and creative being. 
Um, he had an infinite source of creativity in one of the most difficult uh, media that he could possibly have chosen for himself. Um, the thing that we all need to remember about holography that just always confounded me is that you have to be a scientist as much as an artist. In fact, that's the foundation. You really have to have a sense of physics before you, you know, from day one, just from the beginning, to even start to manipulate it as an art form. Um, that's what was genius about Rudy because, and I, I don't often use that word that gets bandied about too much, but he was a high school dropout. He dropped out of school at age 16. So everything that he did was entirely self-taught. Everything that he knew about physics was self-taught and his instincts were just so amazing to learn how to apply that and then take it and make an artistic creative statement with it, his point of view. Um, he was a deeply spiritual person. It was a very personal belief. It wasn't any form of organized religion, and yet that's what really motivated him. And I think when you look through his work, you can see it, it lives there, it embodies that. There is a transcendence that he was always going for. And it's sort of like he knew when he hit that, when it was starting to speak into that eternal, that infinite space. And of course, that's what appealed to him about holography. It's about infinite space and bringing ourselves into it. So um, there's a lot I could go on to. I think these folks should speak more, but I, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to, to go back and forth a little bit because um, I, I obviously knew him at all, all different parts of my life, uh, whereas th these gentlemen sort of represent specific segments, but we all knew him all the time and uh, loved him very much, and he gave a lot of love to all of us, not just me, and I'm very grateful for that. So I was, shall now pass it on to uh, Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Sapan. I think the first time I met Rudy was around 1977. At that time, I was doing um, a lot of commercial work to support my portraiture, and he was working for Hart Perry. And what he did is, in, that, in those days, he ran the copies for Hart. So I would shoot something, and then Rudy would go into a tank of liquid with a couple of other guys. I think Hale Oust was one of them and they would make contact copies by scanning over the original and then go into the dark room and develop the film. When I talk to younger crowds, I have to <clears throat> explain what film is because nobody knows. <laughs> it's very sad. It's almost like talking about waiting for a TV to warm up. <sighs> Clearly, I've lived too long. But Rudy was like, the, the second you saw him, he was a very inspirational character. He was dashing, uh, extremely handsome, tall, lanky, Danish man. Dutch. Dutch, excuse me. It started with a D, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, oh, no, don't. He wouldn't like that. <laughs> okay. But he was, he was different. Instantly, you knew he was different. He had a, a sensibility that set him apart. Um, the first time he came up to visit me, you know, he introduced himself, you know, told me he was working with Hart, but then he says, you know, I know that we're working and we're in different businesses, but there are things that are in business that we have to share and talk about between us. And it was like, wow, what a breath of fresh air. And holography is a real, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh yeah, pain in the ass. <laughs> How do I explain holography if you haven't made a hologram? Imagine you're working with a light wave, and to get into the physics of a light wave, I think it would safe, well, very safe to say that a light wave is smaller than an ant's asshole. So we're dealing in itsy bitsy sizes, which means any movement at all is going to mess it up. We're not gonna have a good result. So right from the get-go, we're fighting sort of an insane battle because if you were in New York City, l let's just say there were influences on stability like the subways, the trucks, the buses that would be 
compelling arguments against what are you doing there? Why are you making a hologram in New York? Uh, out here in the Hudson Valley makes more sense, but we were in the city. It was the place where everyone was gathered. There were a bunch of us in those days. There was Sam and Dan Schweitzer and Jody. Um, and, and it was a very active community. Uh, we all believed at that time it was going to explode. <laughs> we thought that people were going to all embrace this technology instantaneously like we had and that um, holograms were going to be everywhere. They would do everything. Well, you know, as we saw, we were very far ahead of our time. I'm still waiting for that time. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe dinner. It'll happen eventually. What a hologram really is to me, and I think you'll hear a thousand definitions, if you, especially if you go on the internet, you know, about you know, interfering light waves and everything else. To me, what it is, it's sculpture and light. And what we're doing is we're shaping light. And imagine you're trying to take a plaster cast of an object or a person's face. You know, the plaster would go around it. You would have an impression in the plaster that you would then later fill with whatever medium you're sculpting in, you know, whether you're making bronze or wax or, you know, plexiglass. It doesn't really matter. But you're filling up a shape. What a hologram is, is we're taking that impression and we're storing it because it's a light impression with light waves, and film is what records light. So the physics of holography is really all about, well, how do you make light stop so you can record it? And interference is a way to create what's called a standing wave, a wave that physicists are very bright, so they use the word standing wave because the wave stands still. So, you know, you can't, it's hard to take a photograph of someone waving their hand like that because it's going to blur so you can imagine something moving faster than 10 miles an hour because light moves at the speed of light. So it's like two-thirds of the way to the moon in a second. Um, this is our trick and we use the, a trick of interfering waves to stop the waves and to record all the information around it. But that's not as important as what we do with it. Because once we're past the technicalities, then we're into the organic reality of what is the art behind a hologram. The way Rudy saw the art was unique. Uh, I was more of a photorealist. Rudy was a dreamer. He had imagination. He saw colors. He saw shapes. He envisioned doing things that none of us had previously considered doing. Rather than seeing limitations on what a hologram could record, he saw them as tools. How could you leverage this? You know, how could you put weight on one thing to make it do something that it hadn't been doing previously? It was something like looking at Charles Eames, looking at plywood and saying, well, it's not just a board, you know, we can bend it and make shapes that have never existed. He was a dreamer in the best concept of what a dreamer can do. Um, I remember in his later years, uh, he had moved on to, you know, newer ideas and shapes. And uh, I remember visiting him one day, and Hudson's right, you know, he was like an Edison, where he would sit down and brainstorm and come up with one idea after another while he was working on doing multiple colors by having different strengths of rubbing alcohol percentage-wise and, you know, swelling the emulsions to change its color. He was also playing on this little device to make light, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just like he was fascinated. He was like a moth to a flame. He often would remind me of what you guys have to do. He would say, like, I'm a painter, so he'd say, figure that you've got to make all your paints and make your paint brushes and, uh, and, and just do that constantly before you even start to paint. That's essentially what holographers have to do. They had to create their own medium and, and because there was really no precedent, certainly not for Ru what Rudy was doing and probably not you either, Jason. So that's such a, that was, a thing that uh, uh, the rest of us out here don't quite know how to appreciate, that you had to create the medium before you could start using it as your art form. 
we're still creating it. I, I think of it more not quite as a medium, but a medium to large. Um, it, it's a challenge, you know. You're, you're, there's a certain financial restraint because, you know, it, it isn't like the public has endorsed telegraphy. And um, there's just the restraints of nobody has done a lot of the things. You're walking through the forest without a road map and you're just trying to navigate based on your senses and sensibilities. So let me turn it over because I don't want to dominate. And Michael. I got interested in holography, I mean, well, I got interested in photography uh, in high school. Um, and the thing that got me was some, one of my teachers kept me after school one day and, and had her father's equipment and, uh, and showed us how to develop film. And it immediately caught my interest. I, I, was, I was very interested in math, I was very interested in science. And, um, and so I really delved into it like very quickly as a, as a teenager. And then in high school I also, just, I, I, you know, because I was caught by the technicality of it more than anything, uh, somehow I, I, was, I was always reading magazines and something popped up about holography. Um, and Back then, of course, we didn't have the internet, so uh, finding things out, the only thing that was in my parents' house was a Encyclopedia Britannica, and uh, there was no reference to holography in that. Um, and uh, I somehow, at the local photo store, which used to be common, actually, believe it or not, um, uh, they had a book section, and I found this book called Homegrown Holography, which I, this is the original, this is what I bought <laughs> like back in, in the 70s. And, um, you know, so I moved, I moved to New York City uh, to go to school, the school, the school of Visual Arts for Photography. Uh, and I found out there was a museum of holography. So not that I had time, but I figured, you know, well, this, is, this sounds really cool. Let me get into that. So I started docenting um, there. Uh, and, uh, you know, something that no one's mentioned before is, is the, besides the fact of, of, of the, of, of doing holography and how hard it is. Uh, the fact that there was this woman named Posey Jackson who um, uh, invested in a museum uh, in New York City uh, to, to, to show holography was quite a leap. Um, it was a leap of faith. It was a leap of, of uh, uh, the idea that, you know, what we all seemed to believe when we saw a hologram was that you know, it's going to be the next best thing, and um, and we're all going to be part of it. And I think she was caught up in it too when she when she saw one, and so she invested a lot of money into into starting this museum. Uh, she was very supportive of the artists who were doing holograms, and I think it's very important because she sort of formed the foundation um, uh, in, in in having holographers interact with each other in a central place. Um, and I think it's very important. Um, to discuss because it's it's what I think ended up you know uh, you know getting first of all Rudy interested um, and and other people interested um, was the fact that it was uh, readily available to the public to see something like that um, so I was excited to be a part of this um, unfortunately uh, back then <laughs> there was a uh, there was in this building in Soho on Mercer Street just off of Canal Street and it was very hot. Uh, they had this heat in there that I swear it must have been 100 degrees in the middle of winter. And, uh, and also, because holography at that point uh, was really not that advanced, uh, it was, to see a hologram, it had to be in a darker environment. And <laughs> the walls were black, and the heat was 100 degrees. <laughs> and, you know, it was cool to walk around, but as you're waiting for, you know, people to walk in, um, you know, it, was, it got to be very hard to stay awake, and I'd fall, <laughs> I'd fall asleep on my feet half the time. It was kind of funny. Um, but there were interesting holograms all over the place. There was, uh, uh, one of the things was there was this, um, this uh, uh, Ruby uh, portrait hologram of, uh, of uh, Dennis Gabor, who's the inventor of holography, who uh, is another amazing guy, because he actually invented holography before there was a means to make one. Uh, so uh, that, that's incredible in itself, is that, you know, that someone envisioned that this thing would exist uh, before uh, a laser existed. Um, and and it, you, you could make a hologram without a laser, but it's, it's, it's near impossible, and anything you're going to get isn't really worth looking at. 
Um, and so anyway, there was this portrait of him, and I always went to that. Um, my last name is Gabor, and it was weird that I really didn't realize that he invented it until I ended up in the museum. And it was like, wow, I, you know, and I, unfortunately, I never got to meet him. He died a couple of years after I started working at the museum. But um, uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, connection there. Uh, I'm sorry? You're not related? No, no, I, I'm related to Zsa Zsa. But um, <laughs> I'm only kidding. But um, so, uh, so something else, actually, going back to the museum, um, is uh, is how uh, how this exhibit is set up. One of the things I really wanted to see, uh, and one of the things that happened in that museum, if you went downstairs to the exhibit room where uh, more of the art was and less of the technical stuff, um, at the end of the room was the hologram you see here at the end of the room, and what was cool about that was going down there and. And it, it would always, um, every time I looked at it, and it sort of awakened something in me. It was, it was like, um, it not only woke me up, <laughs> but it also, it was just exciting to look at. You know, it never got tired. And I, and I always went down there if I needed to refresh myself. And then, you know, when I was talking to Daniel and, and, and Sarah about placing the holograms, I really was looking forward to, to sort of, looking at that again, but in a, in a brighter space <coughs> um, where, where um, the technology that Rudy had um, incorporated into his holograms to make them, to make them brighter uh, would stand out in a, in a, in a much more uh, attractive way. And, and I'm, I'm really excited that this is here, this exhibit, and it, and it looks like it does. And, and the, the hologram is there like it was in the museum. Um, and it's a, it's a great connection to that past. Um, you know, the other thing is that, you know, so I was working in the museum as a, as a volunteer, as a docent, and, um, and it, was, it was, I really didn't understand it myself. <laughs> and, I'd, and I'd walk people around and I'd kind of read the stuff <laughs> as I was <laughs> showing them <laughs> to try to figure out if I, <laughs> and it, it just, it, it was just really difficult, unless you, I think unless you really do one, it's, it's very hard to, to understand it um, because it is very complex. Um, but, you know, doing that, uh, there was actually, you know, the, the museum was successful enough that they had uh, someone who was in charge of the volunteers. Uh, and, uh, oh my God, her name escapes me right now. But uh, she, was, she was Dutch, and uh, she knew that I had just uh, came in, come out of the School of Visual Arts Photography, and I was looking for uh, work as, a, as an assistant to a photographer. And, uh, and I mentioned it to her, and she said, well, she says, I actually know of a holographer looking for an assistant. And I was like, I was like, I, you're kidding me. Like, really? <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that there was such a, a thing as, uh, as that existing, because I, I got the sense that there wasn't a lot going on in holography, you know, besides the museum. And uh, so she connected me with Rudy, and um, <laughs> I'll, never, <laughs> I'll never forget the day <laughs> when uh, I walked into, uh, I, I went to knock on the door, um, of Rudy's loft, and um, and Kurt, their roommate, walked, you know, answered the door uh, with a towel around his waist, <laughs> nothing more. And I was like, a little like shocked. I was like, okay. <laughs> Is that why you were shaking? I remember you were like so nervous. <laughs> and I was like, what am I walking into here? <laughs> And that news be, you know, it was just, I, I was still, you know, I, I actually was, I was 20 years old at the time. And I, I was still, you know, New York City itself was, was sort of hard for me to get used to. I, I come from the suburbs of Philadelphia and, and it was, uh, everything was just, you know, just a culture shock, you know, because you're, you're being thrown things left and right. And um, Anyway, uh, you know, I, I remember that day. So then, uh, you know, I, I met Hudson and I, and I met Rudy, and, and we sat down, and, and it was it was a very easy going interview, and um, and uh, what was again, you know, one of the things I remember the most is, is how he he had faith in me as as little as I had faith in myself to be able to do these kinds of things, to get involved in something that was so new and something I knew nothing about. And, um, and he took me in and, and he really sort of, I think that, that trust that he elicited to me, you know, made me um, work so hard for him and, and so uh, 
you know, in, in you know, t to fall, you know, into his, in his footsteps, to, to really pay attention to everything he did. And um, it, w it was really a great experience. I, I, I'm telling you today, even today, I, you know, I, I look at that as, as sort of, you know, a foundation for, for how I went on, on in adulthood. Um, but, and, and this is a l larger thing, but also holography, one of the things about a hologram that no one's touched on again is that if you took a hologram and took a piece of it and broke it off, if you broke it into pieces, that whole entire hologram would be in that piece. And, and to, as if to, it doesn't need to be more complex to understand, but you know, how is that possible? Um, but on another level, you know, you, you heard from Jason about how difficult it is and, and Hudson about how difficult it is to make a hologram. Uh, and, and one of those things is that you're dealing with things that are, are, are infinitesimal, some things that you can't really even comprehend. Uh, you know, there's, there's light waves and how small they are and, and how, uh, if they're not in the right place, how it, it wouldn't work. Um, and, and that goes toward uh, this uh, sort of spirituality that, that, that Rudy had. Um, that it's almost metaphys it was almost a metaphysical experience to do this because it was something that you, you, couldn't, you couldn't grasp sort of on a bigger level. It was hard to put it all together and say, how does this really exist? So you kind of had to, in a way, trust that you know, what you were doing was going to come out in a way that you thought was going to happen. But it, 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 it's just... It's one of those things that it, it, it comes down to, you know, you almost have to, you have to have a spirituality. You have to have a trust in, in trust in the universe. He, he always, he always, he always yeah. said things like that. I mean, he, and he said things that were like pretty emphatic. Like he was, he would always say, um, you know, well, trust in the universe was a big thing, but also you create your own reality. And here he was, like literally creating his own reality. And he'd say that, but it was, it meant more than just, applying to the holograms, um, which was interesting because, but it was, it was like, it was like, and I don't want to say this in a bad way because it was, it was almost, it felt like, you know, holography was almost like a religion <laughs> because it, 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 it existed on such a, um, on a level that is so uh, hard to understand. Um, and, and Rudy sort of, uh, that, that's how he, he, it kind of, he worked in, in tangent with that and that was a very big, like Hudson stated, it was, it was what drove him. Um, and, and another thing that wasn't brought up is that, you know, Rudy was like a little kid. He was so, he got excited over the littlest things, you know, but at the same time, you know, he was creating these very complex realities and it, was, it would be exciting to anyone to see these happen, you know, but, but to see him, it was like, you know, it just, it, it inspired him to keep on going and, and to do more. And it wasn't like it was like someone said, oh, you're doing a good job. It was like it, it, creating this thing kind of pushed him forward. So anyway, I want to pass this on to Sam. And we'll go. I th you know, there's a, uh, I, I think that each person has like about five people in their life that they consider, you know, important and their best, the best friends. And Rudy was definitely one of my best, one of those five people, you know, my best, best friend that, uh, you know, I could relate to on so many different levels, uh, you know, and, and we just, we, we, I was able to learn from that. You're talking about the spirituality, uh, you know, which, which, uh, if, if you knew Rudy was, was, was part of it. Actually, uh, he would get after you about, about uh, your spirituality. Uh, he was very important to him uh, on, on that level. And he would, you know, I mean, he'd get mad at you. You know, if, if, you, weren't, if you weren't to a higher level, if you, didn't, if you weren't reaching for a higher level. So he's one of those people that made me reach as, as, as you know, as, as, much, as much as I could with, with, uh, uh, with on every level, with my art, with my spirit. You know, with my personal life, uh, so that all that all uh, worked in part with with Rudy. Uh, probably met him about seventy-five. Uh, you know, from the, the school of holography, and it's been Jody Jody Burns had the school of holography there that we are all involved in. Uh, as as it turned out, uh, uh, I met Dan Schweitzer, uh, who became uh, a, a partner. 
uh, through in holography uh, and in, uh, and in uh, other, other things in video as such. And I met Dan uh, in 69 at, uh, in Cornelia, Georgia in the mountains uh, in a uh, summer stock theater. So uh, Dan, Daniel was, uh, came mostly from theater and I was in theater also. Uh, of course, I, I graduated with a painting degree, which, uh, you know, although I, I, I teach uh, at, at, at School of Visual Arts, nobody has ever asked me for my degree, you know, so it's, you know, it's kind of like a ridiculous thing to, to get a painting, degree in painting, uh, but, but I have one, you know, so, uh, and, you know, I, it's, 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 part of, it's part of my life, but, uh, you know, uh, Dan and I worked with uh, some installation work. We worked in theater. We worked, in, uh, you know, like La Mama, in, in a very experimental theater there. Um, and um, we would, uh, uh, <clears throat> to make money, we would do carpentry. And uh, we helped uh, Jody uh, in sewing and, and a group of people. I've forgotten all their, their names. Uh, um, put together the School of Holography on, on 13th Street uh, in the, the basement of the Quad Cinema. Uh, and there were, but, uh, f I think, four sand tables that were there. Uh, that people came from, uh, <coughs> Cal Cal came from California to the Lloyd Cross School to teach people how to do holography. Uh, and so we were just building the school, and uh, this is our, our famous story is that uh, we saved the Salvador Dali hologram that was going to go to the Dali Museum uh, the next week from a flood because we knew it, it was flood there, and so we went and we stopped it. You know, we we saved it from flooding, so we got a free class. So that's how we got into to holography. Uh, but uh, Dan and I were were teaching there, and Rudy was was uh, renting there, bringing his own 10 milliwatt. Laser, uh, and uh, Jody went to move to uh, to uh, Jersey City, and we took over the uh, the, the school there, and so it became New York Holographic Laboratories, and we rented it, and we we we, we uh, taught, and um, you know we'd have to turn off the air conditioner uh, for every time we we sh we shot for the for the lobby for the quad cinema. And so we would, they would, we'd all, for, I, everybody would always forget to turn it back on. And so people were waiting for theaters would be really heat, you know, pissed at us. Uh, and so, you know, we got a bad reputation in that. But, you know, you, you, you uh, the type of holography that we're doing, continuous wave, you, you cannot move a, a quarter of a wavelength. You cannot move. And, you know, you, you know, it's, we, we work, you know, it's, it's with uh, the helium neon mostly in that at that lab, you know it's that's uh, uh, <coughs> 632 uh, uh, nanometers. Uh, if you know what nanometer is, uh, if you take a marble, uh, is what it would be a, a nanometer. Uh, the Earth, the size of the Earth, would be a meter. So that is, you know, 630 of those marbles, you know, as compared to the Earth. So we're talking about, you know very quarter of a wavelength of movement. So uh, it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, the stuff that we did was, uh, you know, trying to, you know, trying to find an object that didn't look like, like a toy or look like a, a piece of tchotchke to transform it into something. And, you know, it's obvious you can see that Rudy was a transformer. Uh, and, and, what, and how he how he, he transformed uh, his imagery, uh, and uh, I, Dan, Rudy, and I became very close together, uh, and we would have lots of late night discussions about you know how we could uh, how we could uh, make holography work better. I mean, it's, it's became very important, and and uh, the, the transition the the relationship between Dan, Rudy, and myself. Uh, was very close, and uh, Rudy's a numbers man. He would, he, you know, everything's about numbers. You can see all of his things. Has he's worked with number nine on his all of his his additions. So every, you know, it's a mathematical thing with him, 
Uh, and so it's part, of, it's part of this whole dealing with life. It's like the numbers are important, the spirituality is important. You know, and uh, he figured that, uh, that we were all born 33 days apart from each other. You know, I was born first, and he was born second, and, and then uh, Dan was born. So it was actually 33 days. And so we always thought that was a very special thing that we work with. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that, uh, you know, I, I was the only one that was working with art, say, in general, because I got my degree in painting. You know, so I, I, you know, I was official. I could always show that to people if they didn't believe me, you know. But, uh, but you know, Dan was in theater, and he really wasn't. He had he he maybe he worked with uh, you know theater sets and stuff. He he worked with that, but he he really uh, really uh, wasn't an artist per se, uh, and. Uh, he, uh, he became, I think, one of the greatest uh, artists to me because he would take these clay objects and he, he, he'd light it with a laser and you would think these people were alive. You know, he'd, he'd do these, he would do these people with Zendera. You know, you could say that, oh, that's, he must have done, that must have been a real person there. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and Rudy, uh, Rudy worked with Hudson. Hudson's an artist, so he, he was around art. As I as I know, and as I as I understood, he worked with lighting at uh, at the uh, Milky Way, and I think that's where you met. No, and uh, uh, yeah, we met in Amsterdam, and uh, I think I was his channel into the art world in downtown Manhattan at that time. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, you know, a lot of my friends. I went to art school, so a lot of my friends were in the arts as well as myself. So when he sort of followed me over from right. Amsterdam, and um, started seeing what art was about and living it and breathing it as we uh, all were doing back in those days. You know, everybody was doing something, choreography or acting or writing or dancing or, you know, whatever. That was the milieu that uh, Rudy and I lived in at the time. And um, I remember uh, how he started, and I, you all were already ahead of him, but we went to uh, uh, show of holography at the uh, International Center of uh, Photography. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? About 1975. It was 75, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the spark was lit. He saw holography mm -hmm. for the first time. And so, you know, he, uh, uh, you know, started seeking out uh, how he could learn it and what is this thing, holography. And uh, I think that's how he found his way to the School of Holography in New York. And that's how he got on his way. But it, his, it was always informed by that world of art that we lived in at the time in downtown. Yeah, I, 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 I was just trying to figure it out because he really wasn't, his first stuff was very simple stuff. He did light, beautiful light bulbs and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, some beautiful stuff. And I remember, I, I regretted this for a long time. He asked me, so was, well, you know, you sh we should do a hologram together because you know, you, you depend, you know, you should, we should collaborate on something. He says, listen, you know, you've got everything to do. That you should do it. You know, you should you should get going from there. And that kind of you know, I kind of think, eh, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should have really, you know, worked with him more. But you know, my God, what he did with, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, the process. I know he learned, you know, the uh, how how to do the compositions and stuff. And I'm, I'm sure a lot comes from you, and yeah. just from his studying, you know. But what he what he did with. Uh, with holography uh, and optics, and, you know he's, um, you know he he really used holography probably m more than most people I know, probably more than anybody I know. I mean he really used the hologram as an optic. He really worked with uh, making holograms and holograms in his own unique way. Uh, a lot of his stuff. Uh, maybe through mirrors, or he would get these these objects. He would make them delicious movement from it. Uh, he would do it uh, through, uh, th through looking through holograms of uh, it's holographic optical elements. Uh, and in his, some of the last things he did was working with hop, holog hologram hol optical elements. Uh, he would make these incredible star fields, uh, and that is just pure. Um, that's pure holography. That's just beams of light. That's no object at all. It's just the positioning, the angles, the numbers, and where you put your, where you put your uh, the optics, and how. And then he would use 
uh, projections in through that. He would, he would do some really delicious stuff. That's why he, he, he does such beautiful stuff. Uh, uh, the next show you do with him, you should do his reflection work, his, his newer stuff, because it was just, he, he went beyond also that in, in different colors Jason was talking about with the, uh, the liquids. He, would, he had special uh, machinery or alcohols that he would drain so he'd get another color because you know, you'd have to swell the emulsions to get uh, the, proper, the proper colors from that. So, um, I mean, he was, a, he was a real holographic person more than anybody I know. And it's, it's just a, it's just a, he remained uh, one of those top five friends and, and, and I really miss him. I can't tell you how much I miss him because, you know, everybody does, you know. Uh, but it's nice to see the show, you know, here. Thank you, everyone. I think I've, I'm going to ask one question and then hopefully spark a little more conversation, then we'll open up for questions from the audience. Um, and I think all of you touched upon this a little bit, but maybe if we can talk a little more specificity of how does a holographer, or how did Rudy Burkow in particular, innovate through holography? Um, how did he get his information? Was he in conversation with other holographers, with scientists? with inventors, um, I understand he might have been in touch with certain corporations. Um, did he, was it a lot of trial and error or did he build upon existing holographic practices that already worked but then push them in a new direction? So uh, yes. I think we, <laughs> so I think all we, that. all of that, exactly. <laughs> so I think I'm speaking in very general terms because I wasn't there and so if you can maybe anecdotally at least talk about, you know, maybe one example of a hologram that, uh, that Rudy really innovated, um, invented a new type of technique or, or practice um, or object, subject. Uh, I was particularly interested in the transmission holograms which are included in this show, but he definitely made a much wider variety of holograms and also worked with light as a medium beyond the holographic plate, so I, we could also open it up you know, beyond the, the transmission holograms. The, the, uh, the holographic community is still very small. Uh, and it seems that we know, everybody knows, everybody in the world, we know, we know each other. And it's being, being nice to be in New York is because everybody comes from New York. And so we, we met, you know, holographer, holographers throughout the world. Uh, and there is, there is a, a sharing from that, you know, that uh, the rainbow hologram comes from, you know, Steve Benton. Uh, you know, and he was very, he was very open about uh, sharing the math, and it's a very complex math uh, that, you know, you can make, you can make very simple holograms, but if you want to make very complex holograms, uh, you'd work with the math, and Rudy, Rudy worked with the math, and he understood that, uh, and I think... When you say work with the math, what do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, what, where does the math... Uh well, uh, play the, into it. I'm just in terms the of the geometry. Is, the or? math is the geometry, yeah. and it's the color, okay. essentially, that, that that you're looking for. Uh, but also the the shape of the object itself is is a mathematical thing. And he he, he, sped, he set up special uh, system uh, where he would make a, where where he he could uh, he, he would he could see the uh, the collimation of the of the light in his system. You know, he, you know, he was very precise, you know, with it. Uh, he wasn't very sloppy at all with it. And, and, and uh, I, I, I think the, the, the one you see there, the 10 milliwatt building. 12 building, milliwatt. Uh, actually, it's I it's a 12. Yeah. Can okay, I, I always thought it was 10. Because, you know, it's 12 milliwatt boogie. And just in terms of uh, remembering a particular time, uh, I, will, I will never forget when he brought that piece home, that we saw it for the first time. It was really like bringing the baby home from the hospital. We were just, none of us could believe it. All those other pieces out there sprang from that piece. That is yeah. the seminal piece for this show and that whole body of work that he did afterwards because he had discovered it. He'd found his medium and how to use it in this transcendent way that was beyond the math, it was beyond the numbers. He'd figured out how to use the properties right. of a hologram in that, uh, rather tacky rainbow look uh, to modify it and use holograms themselves, as Sam was saying, 
to use holography itself um, as a, a medium that would be two or three generations rather than just uh, making a hologram of this thing. He was using holograms and then another set and another set. So he was manipulating the medium toward, toward his goal, yeah. which was to be ultimately just to capture the essence of the properties of that medium that nobody else had done. So it was the essence of light, the essence of three-dimensional light that can only exist in holography and not in photography, not in sculpture, not all these other art forms, just what holography was about. And that first uh, door swung open with that piece. Mm -hmm. So it was a very dramatic opening well, to a I whole think new that era. The terminal in like, uh, Sorry? Is a, it was a big door for holography. Yes. I, I, I think agree. that really it opened, you know, it opened all our eyes up and said, oh, you know, uh, it could be used in a, you know, in a much different, it doesn't have to be just, you know, just the, a fist coming at you that you could you can you can see the, uh, the fingerprints or whatever you can, you can and you can see all those things, but you know it's just it's something that that uh, holography is, is holography you know and, and uh, it, it just uh, inspired a lot of it's inspired a lot of people you know from that moment. It was a, I think it was a big game changing moment for the art of holography. Yeah. I think there's something that you have to sort of step backwards to understand this. You know, what is genius? Genius is not necessarily having, you know, incredible schooling or anything like that. Genius is being able to look at something and see a connection mm -hmm. that eludes others. When Rudy looked at the artifacts of the holograms that were transmission holograms, we all just saw rainbows, you know, and, and you know, you'd shoot an image and if you got taller, you know, the image was bluer, if you got shorter, the image was redder, and we just sort of took that for granted. It was such a struggle just making them that we were not stepping back in a spiritual kind of way and just looking at the bigger picture of what it was. Einstein, before he was able to do the math of explaining what he would do, he would have what he would call mind experiments, where he would just get it in his head and see something in a really simple way. And then he would work out a proof to prove it would happen. I think Rudy saw that. He saw that this is my paintbrush. I can paint in color. It isn't just a problem, it's a tool. And what he did was, Steve Benton, like Sam just said, was the guy who came up with the rainbow technique. Before that, if you wanted to look at a hologram, you'd have to have a laser to see the image. And it was monochromatic. It'd all be red, for instance, with a red laser. Steve was gifted. He was working for Dr. Land at Polaroid and had the kind of lab that the rest of us dreamt about having and the resources and the assistance, you know, and untold backing and love from Dr. Land that this was something worth sinking money into, even if it never made a penny. You know, he believed in it. And Steve recognized that, you know, well, you know, if I take this transmission hologram and put it in front of a white light, it's all blurry. It's a rainbow and it's all blurry. And he was using like a, a spherical mirror to make the images. And, you know, just fooling around, they decided to cut the light down going into the mirror a little bit on the top, a little bit on the bottom, and as they kept cutting it down until they got just a little slit of light, well, suddenly, not only did you have this rainbow artifact, but you could see the image clearly. It wasn't this blur any longer. So the key to making the rainbow hologram was making these slit masters to shoot from. Rudy would take these slits, you know, and you'd have sand tables in those days because sand is sort of stable and, uh, as we would say, it's really cheap, uh, so we could afford it. And he would be able, with the precision that Sam mentioned, to be able to know where he could twist it in the sand and align several of them to superimpose into a bigger picture where he was blending the colors into something that none of us had ever seen. And it was, it was so simple. It wasn't the complexity, 
It was the beauty and the genius of realizing that he could do this thing. And it was a spark. It was like when Jackson Pollock, you know, and everyone's like looking at his work and it's like, oh, it's okay. And one day he all of a sudden just went nuts with the colors and, you know, it's like, oh my God, you've got it. This is it. This was Rudy's moment. And we all recognized it right away. And, you know, it created like an entire explosion of people playing with colors and holography. And it was no longer a limitation. From my lay point of view, I'm not a holographer like Jason and Sam, but I, 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 it did sort of break everything open from that point forward. Uh, it was an interesting point in time how these things work because uh, it was a nice gradual development. He was getting better and better, and then boom, this happened, and it's everything shot out from that. It, you can really trace it to this particular point in time that uh, his work changed, holography changed, uh, people were playing, you know, I'm just repeating what you said, but basically there was a whole a range of, of color to play with. It wasn't, you weren't just relegated to that horrible rainbow anymore. So uh, it, it was inspiring. It was yeah. just... I'd like to say one last thing, though. Sam is right, um, you know, and, and all of us are right, you know, that the reflection holograms that he did near the end really need to be noted. I think that as much as what he did with 12 milliwatt boogie, when he moved over to the reflection genre and started dealing with time and space in a whole new way, that in time, you know, just like it took this many <laughs> years for, for this to be discovered, but I think that is his true big leap. You know, I think the leap of the 12 milliwatt boogie was the leap for us in the field. You know, suddenly we saw the beauty of something we didn't realize. But I think he made another huge jump when he started doing color and reflection. You know, one of the reasons I was so excited about the transmission holograms is because they really hold their own as works of art within an art museum space. You know, we're sitting in a gallery with photographs there's all sorts of uh, design objects in, in the other gallery. You know, we show painting here. Uh, we really, myself and Sarah and others, the museum really felt like these works um, can really converse with a much you know, wider world of, you know, of art, art and design. And so I'm interested in how Rudy tried to make these contacts with contemporary art curators. And I know he was curated in exhibitions of, f of photography and sculpture and interactive, you know, installations and, you know, how aggressively or assertively did he try to make these inroads and did he, f was there sort of a missionary zeal that he had to take this faith in holography that he had, which was popularized within, you know, the subculture of holographers and really spread this to the larger, you know, public? Uh, yeah, no, he didn't. He, he was horrible at marketing his own work. People had to find him, and he did not make it easy. Um, he, <laughs> he had a one-man show at, uh, at the Whitney, and he didn't even come to his own opening. <laughs> I will never forgive him for that. I, I, that's the way he was, because for him, it was really about the work. And ultimately, what most people don't realize, it, he was really shy. He was really a shy person. And one-on-one, -on -one, he was wonderful. You would have a deep experience sitting and talking with Rudy. But in terms of social situations, uh, it was not his forte at all. So he, he was represented by Grace Borgnick, which was a very good gallery at the time. And um, of course, the Museum of Holography played a vital role in his work being seen. And then um, as it went on in the 90s, he continued to have his own private clients and uh, made a, a, a fairly good living. Not a fairly good. He made. He made a much better living than I was making at the time, just uh, purely through the sales of his own work to his um, own clients, his own collectors, um, uh, to the point where he was getting some big commissions. He did a big commission for uh, the University of Wisconsin. You can help me with this, Michael, because you were around at the time. And then uh, the Bank of America did a big commission uh, that in their um, lobby uh, in North Carolina, 
Charlotte, North Carolina. That was around 1999 or 2000. And then 9-11 happened and the bottom just dropped out of the art market. And when it started to come back, it was only like the blue chip safest of safe art forms and uh, holography by then was totally marginalized. Nobody was even thinking or looking at it. And uh, it really was very painful for Rudy. Not about the sales, but uh, he, he had something to share with people that he felt like nobody wanted to look at anymore. And what I'm really happy to report is that there started to be interest just at the end of his life. Of course, we didn't know it was the end of his life, but just shortly before he died, he started uh, making uh, reflections again, as Jason noticed and noted. And two days before he died, he sold his biggest reflection piece. So he was so excited about that that, you know, we had gone into real estate. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of different things, basically, because he needed to make a living. Um, and um, he, he just wanted to get back to his work uh, when, he start, when he could afford to. And he sold a, a magnificent piece two days before um, he dropped out of a heart attack. So he went out feeling wanted and loved and that his, his work was being uh, appreciated again. Do you wanna? Yeah, talking to that, one of the things that, you know, I mean, he may have been, <laughs> it was funny hearing you say he was bad at marketing himself, but I, you know, I mean, this guy was a one-man band. You know, not only was he bringing holography to another level, you know, but he was, you know, it's, you know, I, when I worked with him, I was, I was his only assistant. I think he was, I was the only assistant that he, I think he ever hired. Um, and, and what he did, I mean, you know, making the hologram is a leap. But then, all right, now, how do you display them? And, and he had to come up with these ideas that were just, um, I, I, that, that, was, that was the thing in itself, is like coming up with those frames and how they were made and, and how he could make them himself because no one's going to make them for, for him. Uh, the, the, uh, the tripods you see there um, were, uh, uh, I think it's the name of this, Lights, uh, L-A-I-T-Z, which is a very uh, sort of high-end photography uh, manufacturer. At the time, their factory was in New Jersey. Um, and, and most photographers, you know, appreciated the quality of the work of this company. And, and he felt so strongly about the quality of his work that, that you know, he thought, well, this is uh, some, uh, you know, a, a higher-end mechanical part that he could make as part of the display. And so, but that's fine, but then, you know, he had to figure out a way to frame them. And, and f so he found this metal uh, fabricator who, who made the frames. And I'm telling you, uh, you know, uh, he had to come up with it, and then he had them made. And because no one had ever done anything like this before, ha he ended up sending half the frames back. And he said, listen, he told the fabricator, I remember, he was like, I'll pay you whatever it, it, it allows you to make money but you have to allow me to return the ones that aren't working and I'm telling you it was like he was that perfect he like it was it meant a lot to him that they were that perfect um, and that was that was the display of them you know that's beyond like just making them uh, and but I remember you know he he was very uh, you know he may have been not a great marketer but he it wasn't for lack of effort I just remember him struggling with writing things, and I, I know that you, you know, he passed some things right through you, and, and, and trying, you know, he'd write to museums out of the blue, to, you know, cold, basically cold call, to, you know, try to f find museums that would show his work, and most of them are, you know, the art world wasn't ready at all, um, and, and, and so that was, a, that, was a, that was a tough thing, so he had a kind of, and I think he felt sort of, uh, he, he was torn. He ended up going to, to uh, science museums and sort of hawking his, his, uh, hog, you know, his holography exhibits to them. And he even made this wonderful uh, kids uh, hologram that was interactive with a little booklet and, and, and to try to get you know, sort of kids involved because he understood you know, that you know, what excited him uh, would hopefully excite kids so that, that you know, growing up they would also get 
um, excited about holography and, and, and get involved in the practice. And, and that goes back to uh, something, I forget who brought it up, the, the fact that you know, Rudy uh, and I think everyone in the holography world shared everything that they discovered sort of with each other because it wasn't a competition because if you were at that level that you could make a hologram, you know, it wasn't that you were competing against other, each other, you were all discovering things at the same time. And, and Rudy was very, I, I felt he was very generous in that way. You know, one of the things he did is, um, you know, he worked with, uh, with Benton. He also worked with uh, several other people who were in uh, university settings. And he'd create papers uh, uh, to try to explain what he did. And I think in that way, he was very successful. Because if you look at some of these papers, you're just like amazed. Like how this guy that dropped out of high school write these extraordinary papers on these technical uh, things. You know, it was, it was very, you know, uh, as challenged as he was uh, to, to, to write words down, because, you know, English was not his first language, um, to, to, to write things out was, uh, you know, and, and marking himself, that the challenge, it's that, that challenge is one thing, but, but getting the technical terms and then being able to share them. I remember uh, one of the things that happened is he, in, he invented processes that really hadn't existed before. And, um, and like I said, he worked with uh, university uh, professors and stuff to get, to get those papers um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that uh, papers are written. But he would never like uh, patent them. He would never try to own them. You know, he was always about sharing them, and he wanted to share them in the best possible way, so they were understandable by even the most technically uh, astute uh, people. Um, uh, so, you know, one of the, you know, going back to uh, the original uh, I idea of, um, uh, I guess it was marketing or uh, just. just yeah, it, it was a, that was an impossibility. I mean, he was yes. He I, I I'm not very familiar with his representation from a gallery, but I knew it was a real hard thing for him to do to to break into uh, the idea of showing his his work in an art uh, thing because it, again, it's it was a new thing. There were, the, the art world hadn't even I don't I think most of the art world didn't even know what this was, uh, and I think it was hard for them to comprehend. Uh, well, you know, I, I think. A big part of it was that it was just so hard. It is so hard to make a hologram. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the art world and certain people in the art world, like Bruce Nauman, flirted with it, and they would have somebody make a hologram and put their name on it and things like that. But for the most part, there was just not that body of artists out there who were willing to do the work, to learn the physics, to make a hologram, except for you know these mighty few that were willing to plow through and continue to do it. So. It, you know, it was, except for those collectors who had the vision and understood it, it was really hard to generate a whole big place in the art market for it. And ultimately, that's always what it's about. Art is a business in New York. And you've got to figure out how do we market this thing now? And how do we fit into that industry, that business? And uh, because I think a big part of why holography was very challenged about being accepted was because it was just so hard for artists to do and um, to generate enough work that the galleries were going to be interested in developing that as a, as a, as a channel of, of money, <laughs> of revenue, basically. That's really what it comes down to. Um, holography in the, in the art world is always been marginalized. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's, the, the 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 great show at the, uh, the ICP uh, that inspired Rudy had really one of the worst reviews. Hilton Kramer. We we all know Hilton Kramer because yeah. uh, he he just really had gave, just gave a terrible review. I myself I, I I love the history of art. You know and you know and in the, the, most art had a lot of. BS, but you know they had it. They had it. You know, it's like oh, it's like it was like to me, it was like a badge. You know, it was like it, the impressionists were had. You know, they they had a hard time getting into it. So I thought it was like kind of a badge, but in reality, I was, I got, I'd like to make it put it back to you. You know, uh, because um, you know people come in to see holography. It's, you know, just recently Governor's Island, people come there and. Uh, and they say, I've never seen anything like this. And this is extraordinary stuff. Why, why don't we see more of it? 
you know, and I kind of like to go put the, the question back to you. Uh, what inspired you to, to do this show? Because it's, it's, it, is, it is not something that is accepted so much in the art world. And uh, it, there is a difficulty in, in working with that. And I think it's, it's maybe a little brave of you, although it's incredibly brilliant work. I, it's not brave of you at all, and, but, but it is in, in the art world. Well, I, th I think this intersection of art and technology or art and science is really essential for where we are now as a society. And there was so much um, ferment within that area from the 1960s and 70s. And there's been a number of exhibitions that I either curated or helped get going here that explored this idea. So the Video Freaks were a group that right. were among the first to take handheld portable video technology and create art with it. Um, <clears throat> Dick Polich exhibition, also someone pushing the technology of, of metal casting and, and fabrication. So I think these collaborations among scientists, technicians, and artists who are able to, you know, now they're called hackers now, you know, and, or makers who are taking hold of the technology and using it for their own ends is something that's really in the air. And all of these lines have, uh, are starting to erode institutionally um, between art and design and technology. And I think another thing that's, that's up in the air now that you've uh, addressed here is um, analog. You know, all of this holography, all of these guys were creating analog uh, work. You know, this is all, it's not digital. Uh, this is all from the uh, world, the pre-digital world. And I think currently people are interested in that again. It's a whole generation that only knows digital. And so there, I think there's going to be a curiosity about what was created during the analog era. Right. We're also in the sort of the post Harry Potter society where magic and wonder prevail. And I think that people want to have this a magical, wondrous experience in the art world, and, and Rudy's right there to provide that. Um, so maybe, Jason, one more comment, and we'll have time for a question or two. I've been running my gallery in the city now for over 41 years, and it's only in the last few years that I'm seeing exactly what you're talking about. Analog has once again become connected with people. And I think they're beginning to appreciate th there's a certain sterility to the digital world that analog um, is the counter for. That there is more of an emotional content in the work. Um, when I'm teaching at NYU, uh, there's at this point, my classes are always waitlisted. In the past, it was very hard to get people to be interested. So, yes, there, there's a shift. Something in the air has changed, and I think that you're right. Um, we've reached that moment where it's a threshold, where there's enough technology that is now art, where, once again, things that were bypassed and overlooked previously are now ta getting that second look that they always deserve. So, does anyone have a question? Yes, Professor Hearn. Well, I think that, you know, when we're talking digital holography, there have been a number of companies that have come and some have gone, uh, as is usual in any field. Uh, most notably in uh, Austin, Texas right now, there's Zebra that is producing some incredible full color, digitally created holograms. Uh, and you're getting artists that are using, you know, their technological know-how to bring their computer-generated art into, you know, people working in Maya. and um, I think that's a, a whole new area of holography. It's a different kind of, it's a synthesis and it's a hybrid. You know, the computer-generated holograms uh, open new doorways and paths as to how we can see light. Um, it is a uh, sort of a haploid, you know, it's, it's the half-sun of a... Uh, 
uh, a technology that still hasn't really found itself. And, and when you say it's easy to make holograms, well, it's easy now. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like once you've crossed the desert, it's easy to know there's a reservoir on the other side. But when you're in the middle of the sand and the sun's beating on you, it's not quite so apparent. Uh, you know, it isn't hard to make a hologram. I mean, someone comes into my place and I'll, I'll teach them inside of two hours, they'll walk out with a hologram and an understanding of what they've done. But that's not learning holography. That's, you know, making a clay ashtray in a sculpture class. <laughs> I love clay ashtrays, although, you know, people don't smoke any longer, <laughs> but... The it's the problem with clay ashtrays, indeed. Um, but, you know, I think that there's a bright future, and like everything, you know, it, it sort of has to find its own path. Uh, you know, having a gift doesn't mean that people appreciate your gift. You know, sometimes things have to change in the world so that, you know, the, the field becomes properly plowed so that things will grow. You know, it might be a great field, but you know, things don't just happen. Connections. Everything has to connect to something else for it to work. You know, in science, we know this. You know, this, all theories need a foundational theory to work from. I mean, in, in holography, without the physics of understanding the actual nature of light waves, I mean, there was a point where people didn't know light was a wave. Uh, you know, and we all take that for granted now. but. With holography, there are easier things. I mean, there, there's film that develops itself. Uh, there's holograms where, you know, the resolution you can get now in a hologram is thousands of times better than the resolution we used to get back in the old days. I mean, I think about like Kodak plates, uh, you know, and how tough those were to work with. And, uh, you know, now there's a guy in France, uh, his company is Ultimate Holography, and Beautiful, full-color holograms. It is art. It is clearly art, but you know, art is in the eye of the beholder. I, I, uh, I think that uh, also every holographer is uh, al always reaching. You know, it is always a research. You're not just a scientist and artist. You are, you know, I, I tell my students that you know they they might, you know find that next incredible step because we know, we all believe in holography. It's on, I don't want to say it's a religion, but we do, it's a very, you know, it's a very central part of our being. We believe in it to a core, you know, and, and we see it, we have visions for it. Uh, and we work towards that, towards that, towards that vision of it. And everybody working in holography contributes to that is MIT, where, where Steve went from Polaroid, where he's, he's uh, researching to, uh, television. MIT is, is, is taking that. He, he worked at MIT and he, after he passed away, there's still, it's continuing to work with uh, holographic television. A lot of the people from Zebra came from that technology. And, and there's some incredible stuff, you know, uh, uh, happening through, through the world still. I mean, people are, are really, every time you, you make a hologram, you're hoping to you know, hit that, that point. You know, as I say, I, I said to my students, you know, that, uh, you know, they might be the one, you know, because, you know, it's, you got a fresh view of, of, of what it is, and you can look at it from another, another view of, of, of uh, where, where holography, you know, will, will, will take off, you know, and um, anyway. Great. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has a question or final comments? Want to be our, our closer? Well, I, I don't want to close so much as that. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about <laughs> the, the, the studio that Rudy had uh, on, on Fifth Avenue. Um, there was this, uh, on the corner of 17th Street and Fifth Avenue, there's this, there's this now there's a shoe store, I think, right? It's Cole Hahn or something. Yeah, something like that. And uh, you know, his, the address of his, his studio was at 91 Fifth Avenue. I, I don't know if 91F is in this exhibit, but um, you know, there was an, there's a hologram named after the, the address. But uh, on top of meeting Rudy in, in this amazing loft that uh, Hudson shared with him um, on Fifth Avenue, you know, he had the studio in the base. He had to be in the basement. 
and we were on, uh, it was on Fifth Avenue and, and, uh, and 17th Street. And w where that is, is that it's right in, in between Broadway, Union Square, and 6th Avenue and 17th, and there are subways. And one of the things about making a hologram is that it can't move more than a wavelength of light or, or it won't work. Uh, Sam said a quarter of a wavelength. I, I never heard that, but okay, a quarter. And um, so what we, we, I had to go in, I, I did a lot of the exposures and you know, he'd set everything up, we'd make sure everything worked. You know, we did an exposure work. I'd go in at night, overnight, and, and do these exposures and I had a sort of, it was almost, you had to meditate, you know, to make sure, you know, because you, you know, subways, you can't tell what their schedule was. <laughs> so, you know, even though we were a block away from a subway either way, we still had a kind of like almost, uh, you know, in, into it, the idea that there was not a subway coming and that the, the, the uh, exposure was ready to be made. Um, and, uh, but anyway, the other part of it is that, you know, there's this, this, this magnificent Victorian gate, and I don't even know if something like that exists anywhere else in, in the city, but maybe at the Dakota or something. And to get to the, you know, this basement, we had to open this huge gate, and here I am in the middle of the night opening this huge Victorian the gate in New York City, you know, which is from another era. And, and then he, he had put in a, a spiral staircase down to the, um, to the basement. So anyway, it was, it was another magical thing that, you know, I think, you know, for the record. <laughs> I just wanted to like, you know, talk about that a little bit. And it was just, it was one of these, it was like a cocoon sort of a situation. He had this wonderful table. Uh, he did it on sand, but he also had uh, a metal plate where he could put magnet, you know, he could place things on magnets. So that would also, you know, keep things, I mean, one of the things that, uh, with with the uh, the second uh, generation holograms, is you had a you had these uh, 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 master holograms, which had to be basically perpendicular to make them work. And and really, the only way to do that was on a, on a you know to get them on the sand would, was would be almost impossible without a level, and they'd still move. So you know the, the metal kept it pretty perpendicular. Um, so uh, you know, and then so he'd have the metal plates, and then there'd be the there'd be um, you know th th this uh, uh, concrete block that was uh, sitting on tire tubes that you know isolated the table from the vibrations of the city and here we are in the middle of New York City and you know we had to wait and and there was a time it's very interesting there was a time you know this is you know we're all, all of us here are old enough to remember that New York City at night was it did become quiet it actually you wouldn't believe you know that there was actually times when you know now it's like you know probably all the time is like you know traffic and all kinds of things but at that time you know you could you could depend on even on a Sunday like it was amazing how dead New York City was <laughs> it's such a different era um, but anyway the magic of, of that of that um, of that studio was really uh, something to, to be a part of and to go in there alone at night and and do these exposures, and, and uh, you know, I just did the dirty work. You know, I went in there and you know, I do the exposures after after we did tests and everything, and and developed them. And basically, they were developed, uh, you know, regular black and white chemicals. So there was nothing, there wasn't a lot of special, you know, technology re regarding that. Um, but it was uh, it, it was quite an experience to be in that black place in the in the in the in the underneath, you know, New York City. Well, you know, every you know you know, the city never sleeps is going on, like all around you, and you're trying to be quiet and still, and, and uh, anyway, that was just, uh, I just wanted to say that. Well, thank you to our, our panelists. This has really been a wonderful conversation, and there's so much more to be said and to be known about Rudy Burkhout, so I do hope that this isn't the last word and that this exhibition will lead to future conversations, publications, exhibitions, um, for Rudy and really for the entire field, so. And I just want to thank you, uh, Daniel and Sarah, for um, thinking to do this exhibition and introducing Rudy's work and holography in general to a whole new generation of people who've never seen it before, you know, and can get excited about it and run with it themselves now. I think, uh, I, I for one, from that generation, is very appreciative uh, that this work can go on and be seen again. Thank you.